Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. When one makes a commitment to become a Christian, he or she, if they are serious, are required to lift up and bear the cross. This is not a rhetorical feint. If you take this call seriously, it means a life in perpetual opposition to power, including the institution of the church itself, and a commitment to always stand with those the theologian James Cone called the crucified of the earth. It is a hard and lonely road, one that will see you if you truly stand with the oppressed soon treated like the oppressed. Roy Bourgeois takes this call seriously. He has paid the price. Born in a small Cajun town along the Mississippi River in Louisiana, he played football in high school and after graduating from the University of Louisiana, joined the Navy, eventually ending up in Vietnam as a lieutenant where he would be wounded. Vietnam, he writes, became a turning point in his life. He worked in his off hours with a Catholic priest and two nuns who ran an orphanage seeing in their work a compassion and love that was in stark contrast to the violence and death of war. He went to seminary and became a priest. He worked in the slums in Bolivia during the U.S.-backed military dictatorship of General Hugo Bonzer. He decided he could not be an apolitical priest, only saying mass and baptizing babies. He spoke out against the political repression, leading to his arrest and expulsion from Bolivia. This was just the start. He organized protests outside Fort Benning, Georgia, where the U.S. was training Salvadoran soldiers to fight the leftist insurgency. He illegally entered the base to broadcast a taped message by the assassinated Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero, calling on Salvadoran soldiers to stop the repression, an act that saw him sentenced to 18 months in prison. In 1990, he entered the base again sprinkling his own blood, along with the blood of other protesters, including Medal of Honor winner Charlie Litke, over photographs of six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper and daughter, murdered by U.S.-backed death squads in El Salvador. He went to prison for another 16 months. He defied the Catholic hierarchy by actively supporting the ordination of women, and for this act of justice, he was expelled in 2012 from the priesthood. Joining me to discuss his remarkable life of resistance and his steadfast fealty to the Christian call is Roy Bourgeois, author of Male Supremacy in the Catholic Church and Insider's View. So, Roy, I want to begin uh, early on in the book where you don't talk about it in detail, but I'd like you to explain it. You are in, a, uh, I believe, a barracks or somewhere. You're attacked. I think there are eight people who are killed, uh, you yourself are wounded. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, I, I was transferred to the space thinking it was near Saigon, I would be safe there. But then I learned there was no safe place to be in Vietnam. And one night, actually, it was about four o'clock in the morning, we were attacked. And um, we just had to take cover. We were trained to do that just in case this would happen. And it was totally by surprise. And um, I regret to say that um, some friends were lost. There were a number killed, many wounded. I was very fortunate. I was among the wounded. And, um, but it really, that experience causes one to really uh, reflect. And I began to realize how fortunate I was to, I remember then just months later, my year in Vietnam had ended my tour. I was four years in the military as a young lieutenant and I was going home. And as that plane left uh, Saigon, returning, plane load of us to return back home, many of us wept. Uh, we were alive. We lost some friends there, and we were just grateful to be alive. It was a new beginning. It was a new beginning. So, as you know, my father was a Presbyterian minister. He served in World War II. What was interesting about 
him and his generation is that so many of the other uh, ministers uh, in his uh, around him came out of the experience of war and entered the church because of their experience in war. And I'm wondering if uh, Vietnam served that same role for you. It, it was a turning point in my life. I mean, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I didn't have to go. I was two years aboard ship after I became a young officer. I uh, went to Greece at a NATO station for a year, and then when they were asking for volunteers, I I believed our country's leaders. I was also a, a very conservative, traditional Catholic. Many bishops, like Cardinal Spellman, they, they were calling for... Um, saying that the, the, the cause was noble, that, that it was a noble thing to go there to stop the spread of communism. I believed them and I went. And um, I later learned, especially after that experience there in meeting for the Olivier, caring for all these children, a few hundred children, um, I would go there with my buddies to try and help them with food and medicines. But I began to see the war for the first time through the eyes of the victims. And this priest had a big influence on my life. I had never met someone like him. He was a healer. Um, he was really, um, in a sense, I was learning for the first time the meaning of that word solidarity, solidarity. And um, I talked to an army chap and my fourth year was coming to an end. I had played, expected to make the military a career, but that would that change now. I wanted to become a missionary priest like Father Olivier and be a healer in our world, a peacemaker. And I came home and later joined the Marino Missionary Order. And I just felt it again. Once again, it was a new beginning. I was alive. And when I entered the seminary, I must say my life had a lot of meaning. I felt joy and hope once again. There, there was a line in your book that I thought was important. Uh, you're at the orphanage. You're volunteering your off hours uh, with this Catholic priest and the nuns. And you say that he wasn't trying to convert anyone to Catholicism. Most of these people were Buddhists. Uh, yes. And I thought that was really an important point. It's about bearing witness. I want you just to expound upon that. Yeah, I was just very moved because, to be very honest, I was never that old. Well, I grew up a traditional Catholic in, in Louisiana, and we were taught never to question the church's teachings. And But this priest was the first priest I ever got to know. And what really inspired me was that he was just filled with compassion for the children who were being killed, so many of their parents, these were orphans. Their parents had been killed by our bombs and napalm and um, our, our bullets. And he was a healer. He stood out. He was from Canada and had been in Vietnam for years. He'd gone there as a young missionary priest. And one thing that inspired me too, he was not trying to convert to these children who came from Buddhist families. He wanted to uh, just to try and get them um, to, to be healed. Many of them were sick, wounded by our bombs again. And um, he stood out. And I thought, really, I no longer wanted to spend my career in the military. I started thinking of being a missionary priest like this priest. And I talked to an army chaplain about doing that. And he recommended the Merino Missionary Order headquartered in New York, also in New York, with missions in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I remember I just felt, wow, this, this is what I want to do. And I returned home, again, feeling some new hope, joy, and it was, again, once again, a new beginning. I was alive. Let's talk about seminary, because when you entered seminary 40-plus years ago, uh, the Austin Marinol no longer, I think, has a seminary. Vocations have fallen, uh, you know, dramatically. Uh, this will get to the whole point of your book in many ways. Uh, but let's uh, juxtapose what it was like in the seminary in terms of vocations, uh, in terms of the strength of the church and what's happened today. I mean, that was way back in 1966 when I entered the Marino community. I went to their seminary in Glen Ellen, Illinois, outside of Chicago. At that time, there were over 300 seminarians. Um, they had over a thousand priests working in Asia, Africa, Latin America. 
well, that has all changed. You know, I mean, today, today, fast forward, um, there's only 16 seminarians, only four in the United States. Uh, the seminary has since closed. Um, they're down to 250 priests. Um, the majority, more than half of the 250 are over 70 years old. In short, Merino is uh, on life support. And Mike Merino is just a microcosm of what's going on in the bigger church, the Catholic church. Once again, I think because it became clear, but not, not in the seminary. When I went to the seminary, we didn't question the all meal priesthood. Um, we, we, did, we didn't have a problem with women, but something happened to us over the next six years as I look back on that experience. Uh, little by little, being put on a pedestal, pedestal, we were told that we were special, called by God. And what we could do, women could not do. We were the chosen ones to be leaders in, in the faith community. And, um, and so again, little by little, we become addicted to, I could see that as a look back, addicted to power. And how we began to see women as a threat to our power and very privileged lifestyle. And that addiction to power only accelerates really uh, when we become ordained and we're treated different. And it took me years actually in the seminary. We didn't really have anyone calling for the ordination of women. But then it was years later that I began to meet very devout Catholic women in my ministry. And as a priest, I must say, I was very happy. I found the meaning and the joy and the hope I was seeking in life and went about my ministry and got a lot of support from the Merino community, my fellow priests working on this issue of the School of the Americas military, um, U.S. military uh, involvement in Latin America and what, how we were causing a lot of suffering and death. And when we started the School of the Americas Watch protest and going to prison, I among the many, um, my fellow priests supported me. They came to our vigils at Fort Benning to protest. But something happened when I began to meet uh, Catholic women in my ministry, uh, talking about this injustice of US foreign policy in Latin America. I discovered uh, an injustice uh, closer to home. It was in my church, the Catholic Church. I began to meet devout Catholic women who said to me they were they were called like I was to the priesthood. And what I heard from these devout women, many of them in the movement I was a part of, the School of the Americas Watch, it kept me awake at night. I began to ask basic questions, you know, um, who are we as men to say that our call to the priesthood is authentic, but the call of women is not. That doesn't Galatians uh, 328, the Holy Scripture said very clearly, it's not complicated. Uh, it says very clearly that, um, that men and women are created of equal worth and dignity. They are one, they are one. Men and women are one. And both are called, of course, to the priesthood. And I started to ask my fellow priest, uh, why can't women be ordained? And I remember I thought I would get a better response, but I, began, I underestimated, let me put it this way, I underestimated the depth, the depth of the sexism and the misogyny uh, in, in the church and in, in, my, in the priesthood. I was quite surprised at the, the resistance and the anger I got when I started asking my fellow priests, why can't women be priests as we are called, they too are called? And that was only the beginning of my being expelled from the priesthood. Well, uh, you eventually take part in a uh, kind of ad hoc ordination service for women, uh, and this leads to your expulsion. You write in the book, the crisis in the Catholic Church is not complicated. If the patriarchy that dominates the church is not dismantled, and women are not treated as equals, the church will continue to diminish and eventually die. That's what I began to see. It became very clear that we were in trouble. The Merino Missionary Order was but a microcosm of the, the larger Roman Catholic Church. 
it's in a crisis. And at the core of that crisis is uh, the all-male priesthood. At the very core is male supremacy and how men, how we somehow, we were not that way when we entered the seminary. Um, something happened to us. And of course, over the years, many of the ordained priests left and married, and they, of course, were expelled, and they did not fear women or see them as a threat. They married, and they were expelled. Somehow, I just cannot see Jesus expelling someone, one of his followers, who who, who, was, who said that um, he was going to get married, that they had to leave the community. But let me just say... The church is in, in is in a big crisis. The sexual abuse scandal, of course, contributed to that. But at the very core is the all-male priesthood, men who see women as a threat. You write, among the thousands of Catholic priests who raped and sexually abused thousands of children, the vast majority were not expelled from the priesthood or excommunicated. Every woman who has been ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church has been expelled and excommunicated by the Vatican. Yes, I, I was very upset, in a sense, um, saddened by the letter I got from the Vatican after I attended. It came to the point where it was time to cross the line. <clears throat> and I did the unspeakable. I actually attended in the ordination ceremony of one of the many women called by God to the Catholic priesthood. And uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, and her name was is Janice Severus Desinski, a longtime Catholic, a teacher in the school, and a longtime friend. And when she invited me to attend her ordination, I thought about it. I knew it was a serious invitation, and I could get in trouble. And I wrote back after much reflection and said it would be an honor. And I went, and hundreds came for the ordination, and. Uh, but when I returned from the ordination, I was summoned. I was summoned by Marino to go to the headquarters. I had to go before the, called the Superior General and the General Consul, the leaders of Marino. And then they sent a report to the Vatican, Pope Benedict, who was Pope at the time. And um, it didn't take long. They sent the report, and I had to explain the the. the, the, the ceremony, the ordination ceremony was the same as when we were ordained. And it was such a joy for everyone to be there. But I must say my fellow priests did not share our joy. They were very upset, very angry. And um, they wrote to the Vatican about my participation in this ordination. And it didn't take long to get a letter from Pope Benedict, the Vatican the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and the letter stated that I had caused grave scandal in the Catholic Church by believing in the ordination of women. I want to ask you about El Salvador. It's where we met. I was covering the war. You were very involved in uh, Salvador. You started the, uh, the America's Watch. Um, uh, but before, I just want to, as an aside, you've also very been very uh, outspoken about GBLTQ rights. And one of the things you did, you write about in the book that I thought was great, you wrote to all your friends in the priesthood who you knew or assumed were gay and asked them not, you do have to come out of the closet, but you do have to stand up for GBLTQ rights. And of course, I believe none of them did. Let's talk about Salvador. You go to El Salvador on a fact-finding mission. Uh, there was a famous moment where you disappear in El Salvador. I think you went off with the FMLN or something. Uh, um, but talk about Salvador. It, uh, I, of course, deeply affected me. I was there for five years, uh, and you just became one of the champions uh, after that uh, visit and, uh, of course, set up this uh, because Salvadoran soldiers were being trained at Fort Benning. But talk about Salvador. After being expelled from Bolivia, after my ministry there for five years, I must say um, I came back to the United States and then became very involved in El Salvador after Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated, gunned down at the altar while saying mass. And just months later, four uh, U.S. church women uh, were raped and killed by the uh, Salvadoran military. And two of them, Maura Clark and Edith Ford, were very no sisters, nuns, and good friends. And I must say uh, what happened to them really... Um, was very serious. Um, 
It was then later that I went to El Salvador, and I had never seen anything quite like El Salvador. It reminded me of the just the violence and the death of Vietnam. But um, I came back from El Salvador. I could not be silent. I, it was a slaughter of the innocents. And what hurt, too, was to see my country, the United States, giving millions of dollars in military aid and, of course, training the military from El Salvador, at the School of the Americas at Fort Benning. And when I was invited to go to, to, to El Salvador on another trip, that's when I was invited to to, to join um, the the landless farm, the campesinos who were being killed, uh, to go off with them, and that was very serious. Um, I was missing for a while. I was alive, but way out in the, the, the you know the the mountains, and um, they thought I had been killed. I was alive. And uh, when I came back from that experience, it was another great opportunity to let the people know in the United States that we have to speak out, that our silence on U.S. foreign aid, military aid to, to, to El Salvador was a grave injustice. When there's an injustice, this is what I learned, when there's an injustice, silence is complicity. And I couldn't be silent. The, you know, about El Salvador, I couldn't be silent about this issue of the all male priesthood. Silence when there is a, an injustice is complicit in that injustice. But I came back, I must say, uh, once again, death was very close in El Salvador. I came back uh, grateful to be alive. Grateful. I want to talk about prison. Uh, uh, you get out, your first bout in prison, you get out and go to, I believe, to a Trappist monastery. I think you last about five months, which is five months longer than I'd last there. Um, uh, but talk about the effect of prison on you. There's a wonderful line in there, I think, where you said that you were freer in prison uh, than you were in seminary. Is that right? <laughs> I know prison, family and friends, I know it was a hard thing to understand. And I've always appreciated that sort of unconditional love for my family, my dear parents and you know, the two sisters and a brother in Louisiana, and the support I got from them and friends. Going to prison, protesting and going to prison for nonviolent protests is very difficult for a lot of people. But for us, it's trying to be true to ourselves, to be true to our experiences in life, which is different from others. And uh, I and others have been in the movement, over 250 who have crossed the line, done protest, and gone to prison. I've served a total of a little over four years in federal prisons over the years. But to be very honest, when I got to prison, um, I did well. I, it was some of the best retreats I've ever had. I'm a great love of solitude. I'm an activist. But I really feel in my life it's important to have quiet time. And prison was a time to, I was in solitary confinement for a couple of months and that was challenging. But there too, I was able to read. I had access to books of the great um, uh, theologians like Thomas Merton and many others, John of the Cross and men and women really were a spiritual, you know, um, gave me courage there. And I always got out of prison feeling, though this happened, uh, when I got out of prison, uh, I was in solitary confinement and became very much of a contemplative. And there was a time when I got out of prison, I thought I was being called to the contemplative life. Uh, I used to make retreats with the Trappist monks in Georgia and outside of Atlanta. And I joined their community thinking this is where I was being called. It was all leading to this, Vietnam, Bolivia, El Salvador. It was leading to, to the monastery to be a contemplative monk. And, um, but I was there only five months, and I realized that uh, I'm not a full-time contemplative. Um, meditation, silence, solitude, spiritual reading is very much very important to me. But I've got to integrate that in my active life. I'm, I'm an act like most people uh, do not live in a monastery or not full time contemplatives. But we need some quiet time, especially at the end of a long day. So many family members, friends, couples, and I to have learned, try to learn to keep that balance. But I came back from the monastery. It was a good experience. And um, returned to Merino 
and really got much more involved in, in the protesting of U.S. foreign policy to Latin America with the support of my American community, I must say. But when it came to the issue of, again, uh, women being treated as equals, uh, honoring and accepting the call of women to the priesthood, they, they just couldn't somehow handle that. Um, and that's when I got in big trouble. I was told the letter from the Vatican, Pope Benedict said that I must recant my public support for the ordination of women, my belief that women can be ordained. I had 30 days to recant or I would be expelled from the priesthood. And I remember going on retreat, giving it a lot of thought and uh, went to the Trappist Monastery to think about that in return, realizing I could not recant. This would be a betrayal of my conscience. It would do violence to what I believed in. And I wrote the Vatican and said, what you're asking of me is not possible. Uh, Our loving God calls both men and women, both men and women, uh, to the priesthood. We are created equal, and I will honor that. And that day will come, I said, but what hurt too was how I and all the women are automatically excommunicated, expelled. But the many, many priests who raped, sexually abused thousands, according to the USA, and the US alone, over 5,000 Catholic priests raped, sexually abused over 12,000 children. And these priests were not excommunicated, nor were the bishops who knew of their crimes and just transferred them to another parish. And of course, that that caught up with the church. The truth comes out. And a big part of the crisis in the Catholic Church today, of course, is that sexual abuse scandal combined with the all-male priesthood. And the church, if it does not change and start ordaining women, it will go the way of the dinosaurs. I want to talk about Pope Francis. He's good on many issues, but not on the ordination of women. Exactly. He's light years on many issues ahead of, you know, like Pope John Paul or Pope Benedict. He's uh, much more progressive. But as the CEO of the all-male priesthood, his position on the ordination of women is no different from Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul. In fact, he quoted them, Pope John Paul, he said, and Pope Benedict said, the door to ordination is closed. He said, I agree with them. The the ordination of women, the door is closed. Women cannot be ordained. And that hurt, that hurt. And, um, but let me just say if, Right now, the, the church is in a crisis. As I mentioned, Mary no is closing many of its missions in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They're down to 250 priests, and more, more than half are in retirement. And um, the seminary that I attended, the two seminaries, they're closed. They're closed. There are no vocations come in there. And if the Catholic church, again, Mary no is but a microcosm, and if priests... I uh, will not be ordained in the Catholic, Roman Catholic uh, tradition, and women will be ordained and treated as equals. Uh, the church will continue to diminish and um, go out of existence. Do you, do you still think of yourself as a priest? Well, they tell us when we are ordained, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, thou art a priest forever. And they teach us this in the seminary. Um, and the many who married, I so many, over half of the Marino priests who were ordained are now married. And many of them continue to be good friends. And some of them continue to do um, mass, say mass for small communities. And um, so many of us have been expelled, but we're taught in the seminary, and I feel, you know, I was a priest for 40 years, another six years in the seminary, and that has been my life. And um, But I, I find, I, I feel a lot of hope, but my hope is not coming from the priest or the pope, or certainly not the bishops. Um, 
it's coming. They are not going to change. It was like uh, they are so addicted to their power. Uh, they're not going to change. My hope is coming from young people, like in Latin America. The change came not from the oppressors, but it came from the oppressed, from the bottom up, not from the top down. I learned that in Bolivia, in El Salvador, Nicaragua. And I see this, uh, so many young people in my own family, nieces and nephews, have not, are not a part of the church um, because of the the church is teaching when it comes to the LGBTQ community, when it comes to women. It's not complicated theology. Uh, so many people in the Catholic Church, especially now, are gay sisters and brothers and uh, women. Um, they are not treated as equal, and there is a cause for that. And right now, again, um, Many Catholic churches are, are closing. In my little, where I grew up, there were three churches back then. There were like seven uh, Catholic priests, They're down to one priest. And that church will eventually close real soon because they don't have the uh, priest coming in to, to, to do the work. But I do believe, perhaps not in my lifetime or doing this interview, this is gonna happen, but I have no doubt that the Catholic Church will one day have women priests and also they will also have to change that church teaching that that um, homosexuality is a, is a disorder. Uh, I have a re I remember, let me just touch on that. Um, I remember meeting after being expelled from the priesthood. I was invited to give many talks, but this uh, the mother and father got in your side and wanted to talk and said that their son, high school senior, had committed suicide. He was gay. They accepted him, no problem. But they were Catholic, and the priests, where they went to mass, would ridicule and really it was very cruel toward the gay people. And also at the school, there was a lot of uh, hurt. And they said, you know, they told me, I'll never forget what they said, that the Catholic Church's teaching on homosexuality played a part in the suicide of their, 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 uh, their son. And that prompted me to write many a uh, long time priest friends in Merino. I was with the community for 40 years and many of them are gay. And I, I wrote to them and asked in a, in a respectful way, could you please break your silence for young people and call for the church's teaching to change? God created everyone of equal worth and, and um, worth and e equality. And there are no exceptions. And the way we, the Catholic Church, is treating uh, in our behavior um, I was a LGBT brothers and sisters. Um, it, it's uncalled for, and it's it, it's cruelty. It's it's a heresy at its worst. And I must say, I, I'm sad to say that very few of the gay priests responded to my letter. They too are accepted in Merino in the priesthood, but on one condition: they cannot break their silence and go against that church's teaching. And they know if they do, the same will happen to them where they are going to be expelled. They are going to lose their power and many privileges as a Catholic priest, and they are not willing to risk uh, losing their power. So they are silent. Silence when there is uh, an injustice is complicity. And I just hope that one day they can break their silence. Great. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com.